And is it true that it's probably like peeling an onion? Oh, totally. I always think of the blooming onion at Outback Steakhouse in the US. <laughs> like, you know, you've just got your layers and it is, it's peeling the onion and um, that's, and there's always something else. And when you're ready to process it, it will come up mm -hmm. um, to deal with it. It's actually a very fitting illustration because as we peel those layers off, we do cry. Uh-huh, right? <laughs>
grandmothers um, and our mothers, and even, you know, on the male side too, but especially as women, it's uh, from our maternal lineage. And we can be holding stuff that hasn't been processed, especially as women, not having the things that we have today um, and carrying that. And especially if we are empathic or intuitive or uh, a cycle breaker, uh, we, we are here to kind of help through that. And our uterus or the energy of the uterus, if we've had a hysterectomy, that is our second heart. It's the second heart of the woman. And so this area within the pelvic bowl is really important to pay attention to and connect to. And there's many ways to do that. So I concentrate and say the hips because of those reasons, but the body in general, because the body gives us messages, you know, shoulder pain is not just the shoulder pain. It can be telling us there's a lot of unprocessed anger and frustration, um, or there's something that, you know, an emotion, like I just mentioned, or a life event that hasn't been uh, addressed or has been triggered in some way. So creating a relationship with your body is my top, top that, number one. That is very interesting because emotions are, and feelings are energy and we mm -hmm. are energy. So mm -hmm. when we don't release something or accumulate too much of something, it does end up transpiring as a physical symptom mm -hmm. okay so is the work you do is it at all related to energy centers or chakras yes yeah so as a yoga therapist I work a lot with the chakras mm -hmm. um, especially the root and sacral chakras because you talk about you know, what's in the hips uh, or the pelvic bowl all of them are, are obviously connected there's deep relationships between the sacral chakra and the throat and the heart and that sort of things but we can't just bypass the foundations and open our heart, for example, unless we work through safety, security issues, uh, sense of purpose, self-worth issues, so that sort of thing. Um, sure. So interesting. Tell me more about that. Tell me more about um, that. Because people say open your heart, but I've never heard people saying you can't until you feel safe. So that's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we can have um, guards up around our heart for, you know, not wanting to be hurt and, and that sort of stuff. And that can be deeply rooted within childhood or within other lifetimes or within, you know, generational things. Sometimes it's not just our stuff. Um, but of course, that's the first thing that we process because we don't, you know, we don't know it's, uh, it's always other people's. And, and so if we don't feel safe and secure, then our heart energy is not truly open to receive love is received like we can open it to receive a filtered love you know like a, a love that fulfills that sense of safety and security which is not terrible but then we might be actually attracting someone who you know, we actually what happens is we have this energy we're putting out there subconsciously and so we want to receive love, for example, and open the heart space. And we want to share love. And it might be easier to share love than to receive it for a lot of people. But if we do not actually have that feeling of safety, security, I'm lovable, I'm worthy sort of stuff, then we are subconsciously putting out energy to receive love that actually, yes, it fulfills that need, but not our real adult love need like this universal love and support it might be something that is all we attract in order to figure out how to still feel safe and secure within ourselves and i don't know hopefully that's making some sense on some level <laughs> but so are you saying that you know in order like we have different levels of need in, when it comes to love starting from our inner child for example mm -hmm. you know the words probably a lot of people know mm -hmm. then once we've healed that filled that void mm -hmm. whether it's ourselves or somebody externally giving us that love or validation then we have the adult mature love which is a current self mm -hmm. and then we can have a relationship or multiple relationships with various types of people that are on this on the level of the mature love. Mm -hmm. so, so until we heal the, the, the baby, the child mm -hmm. within us, mm -hmm. we cannot truly move on to having a, a truly fulfilling adult relationship. Is that close to the yes on, on many levels? You know, there's lots of that go into that. Mm -hmm. But um, if we don't heal that 
um, emotional, you know, attachment issues or, you know, whatever, which are all related to the root and sacral chakras. If we don't heal that feeling of being, you know, not, not lovable, these core wounds that are related to these energetic spaces, um, worthiness and lovability sort of stuff, because maybe we didn't get it in childhood as we needed, um, not always by the fault of our parents, you know, they're human too. Um, but if we don't heal that ourselves by either reparenting ourselves or healing our inner child, you know, there's, you know, and feeling safe, whether it's in the body or the different layers of the body, energetic, uh, emotional, all of these things, then we're not truly opening our heart to receive the love that we, we are told that it does exist but the love that everybody's opening, open your heart. If you're, and I'll get, I'll share my personal experience with this. Do you enjoy learning? Do you like self-help and personal development? Nice to meet you, me too. I encourage you to stay in touch by subscribing to this channel and to our newsletter in which we announce upcoming events like retreats, virtual summits, all kinds of cool things like the new Self Mastery Magazine. And it's super easy. There's a link below the video, or you can go to linktree slash PITV and subscribe. Looking forward to all your comments, suggestions. I'd like to know how I can serve you better. Um, opening your heart takes kind of going through the fire first um, and working through things. And that's when I talk about the root and sacral chakra. Um, but to truly open your heart, you have to... Oh, uh, to go through these things and heal those wounds or else you're kind of, you're still only half open or 75% open. And I'll share my um, experience with this doing personal meditations and, you know, realizing there was a block in my life. Everything in my life seemed great except for one thing. And I thought, why is that? Um, and then, you know, you're doing a heart opening meditation. Okay, the door's open. What I realized as I continued to delve deeper into the heart space is that there was another door and it was a bank vault door. And I was inside in shock, like naked and in shock. Um, and it was something that happened to me in my adult life because, you know, I worked through a lot of things and things process when they're ready. They come to the surface when they're ready. And I was like, oh, wow. I don't consciously realize I live in shock all day long, every day, but my heart knows that. And so my heart, you know, here I was, it wasn't my inner child. It was my adult self be feeling, not wanting to be vulnerable and, you know, being afraid. And it took kind of working with that stage in my life and processing rather than ignoring it and shoving it down to my hips or stomach. And, and so it took that to kind of resolve and open the heart further. And we can really tell how open we are and how balanced we are by the people we attract and situations we attract in our life. So, so yeah, so there, there's a lot related. Uh, we can open our heart all we want, but if we, if we go deep enough, we'll find that it's related to a sense of safety and security usually or self-worth and lovability. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, and is it true that it's probably like peeling an onion? Oh, totally. I always think of the blooming onion at Outback Steakhouse in the US. <laughs> like, you know, you've just got your layers and it is, it's peeling the onion and um, that's, and there's always something else. And when you're ready to process it, it will come up mm -hmm. um, to deal with it. It's actually a very fitting illustration because as we peel those layers off, we do cry. Uh-huh, right? <laughs> <laughs> totally. Exactly. All right. Okay, so tell me a little bit more about vulnerability. I know you mentioned it in your article for mm -hmm. the Self Mastery magazine. Tell me a little bit about being ready to be vulnerable. And if you know you're not, is it a sign of anything? Sure. Um, if you know you're not, there's still more to process. You, you know, it doesn't mean that you can't try, try. It's just that there's more to grieve. There's more to, um, you know, we think grief is, you know, five days, but it's not, it's years. And, and grief comes in waves and our body will show us if, you know, there's more grief we need to express. 
especially through tears or the lungs and that sort of stuff. Um, and so if you're, you know, you know, you're not keep trying, keep working to be more vulnerable. Um, and you will be when you're ready and, and opening your heart, it, it's, you can't force it. You know, you can do heart opening meditations to be more vulnerable, for example. Um, and I'll, I'll share another experience. You know, I've had people lead me through that and I was resistant to opening. And, and I remember after a certain experience where a friend was like, yeah, you're just not, it's not ready. And I went out to a horse ranch and sat down and horses know, horses and ponies, they know where you're holding tension. And I had a pony sit and put their nose right in my heart space. And the owner of the ranch and I both looked at each other because we knew what was going on. And it was sort of like, yeah, but at that point, no heart guided meditation was going to open that. It just wasn't ready. And that's why I mentioned, you know, my heart opening experience was years in the making because I was aware of it, but I had to be ready to actually go deeper in there and find myself in the bank vault in shock. You know, I wasn't ready to come out until then so so sometimes we just have to be patient with ourselves but if our intention and our energy is there to be more vulnerable to allow life us to live life and life to live us then you know we will get to that point to be open to new experiences to allow someone else in it does it's never going to be perfect um so but we can get there little by little and when we're ready we'll be ready Absolutely. And, you know, years ago, I used to, when I heard the word, the word vulnerable, I used to think, oh, that's, you know, the weak people, the ones that, you know, are sorry for themselves and whatnot. But now I know it's actually quite an opposite situation. Mm -hmm. It requires a lot of strength mm -hmm. and peace and that security, inner safety to allow yourself to be vulnerable. People who are not willing to be vulnerable are usually the ones that are scared and hurt mm -hmm. and they haven't come to that place of being courageous mm -hmm. to open up. So vulnerability and courage are really, you know, two sides of the same coin and then authenticity kind of coming with that. Mm -hmm. So as we, we're learning all these things about ourselves, mm -hmm. we, we learn to see other people for who they really are and be able to help them in a system. So now if I see a person being vulnerable and know that it, it's taking them a lot of courage to do so versus like, oh, they're just like to complain about life or they just like to feel sorry for themselves. Again, it depends on how they position that. But mm -hmm. is it true that it requires a lot of strength and courage? Totally, because on an energetic level, when we're not vulnerable, when we're trying to block everything out, we're actually attracting what we're blocking. So when we allow ourselves to be courageous and vulnerable and open ourselves up to whatever it is, you know, we want or desire or open to, we then allow actually it to all come in. And that takes a lot of courage. Yeah, because it comes with an element of unknown, right? Mm -hmm. And trust. Uh huh. And flow, like it, it, those concepts may seem basic, but you know, where I am in my journey, I'm realizing that it's not a simple thing to just learn how to trust that everything <laughs> will work out for you. It, it is almost like closer to passing that big mountain, right? Like it's on, on the healing journey down mm -hmm. that, that you learn how to trust. Mm -hmm. You don't just give trust. You don't, you don't, as a kid, you do, but then our life teaches us not to, and we get, you know, all guarded and whatnot. So to learn how to open up again, it's like we need to be born again. Almost. Right? Definitely. Yes. I mean, we, we, it's really, yeah. Born again, finding ourselves. And I love the analogy of the climbing the mountain. We think that's the hard work. I've climbed a mountain before it is hard. Um, but going down, yeah, that is when we really, because trust is, is not, um, not always easy. And someone told me yesterday, you know, you just have to accept things and trust that they're for your highest good. And, you know, no one teaches you how to do that. You have to kind of figure it out and just let 
like my grandma would always say, it doesn't matter what your beliefs are, but she would say, let go and let God, you know, it's just like, and it's like, that's simple, but yeah, how do you do that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think trust. one way I learned to do that little by little is looking back, you know, in hindsight, mm -hmm. how I felt when I was going through something that oh, seemed sure. like the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Right. And how later on it ended up working for the greater good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So it's just yeah. having, I guess it's learning to adopt a new set of eyes mm -hmm. with the beliefs that we adopt, right. On learning the old beliefs, adopting the new helpful beliefs. Mm -hmm. And that is like changing the lens from mm -hmm. the one the negative one where we view mm -hmm. our past, like we're the victim of all the circumstances. Mm -hmm to the one like, okay, all of those things actually worked out for the better and look yeah. where I am today and who, you know, what kind of person I am today. So a lot of self-reflection and I know you mentioned self-awareness in your article. What would you recommend people do to get to a higher level of self-awareness? Because it's also a journey. It's not like, you know, one day you're not aware and the next day you're aware. Of course. So what are some of the practices that you recommend? Yeah, it's, it, you know, the biggest one is meditation. I mean, you can cultivate some self-awareness and body awareness through movement, which is a good place to start if you feel like your mind can't settle into meditation. Although there's tons of different types of meditations out there. Um, but you can always concentrate on your body first. And, and especially if you have trouble concentrating or um, had a lot of trauma, uh, connecting to something more tangible, a meditation. But I would say meditation because what it does is it trains your mind to settle down. It's never going to stop, but it trains your mind to settle down. And really, then that's when you can tune in to your heart space. And what do you really want? What do you really need? Um, but it, it takes some training and it's, it's not just one day. It's not just, um, you know, one time, like you said. But then we start to recognize things like we start to recognize patterns. We start to recognize limiting beliefs. Um, but I would say meditation in at least 10 minutes because it takes up to like eight to settle and drop in if that's new um, or if you're restarting a practice. But that's really um, the best way to train that self-awareness. Mm -hmm. And also things like journaling, right? Or uh, mm -hmm. actually had a recording last week and the lady mentioned, she's like, I can just do a voice note, she says, when I'm driving because uh -huh. I have a pen to write it with. And I love that because it uh, happens to me so often that my, my mind starts going crazy and I have nothing to write it down with, but I know I should, but then I get home and I'm like, oh, it's already passed. Yes. So lots of tools these days, right? Yes, of course. No, journaling is a really great one. Um, I write notes in my phone because I don't do voice. I should do voice notes, but I have a toddler, so I never listen to them. Um, and so, uh, but uh, yeah, writing those notes or take, I take screenshots of stuff like to remind me. Um, and then, yeah, just trying to get out like that, writing things down or that voice notes that you're talking about is another great way because then you're realizing and you're not filtering yourself like you're just free flowing mm -hmm. beautiful all right so tell our listeners where they can find you i know we're going to put some links below the video and a link to the magazine as well where your article is published but tell us maybe like your website or main social media anything like that sure so you can find me at alyssafinnick.com and I'm mainly on Instagram and Facebook, although I have a YouTube channel and LinkedIn and stuff, but Instagram, my handle is Alyssa Finnick and so Facebook as well. Um, so feel free to reach out um, and connect with me there. Always sharing lots of fun information. Awesome. Yeah. Make sure to follow Alyssa. I know she produces lots of beautiful content as well. Thank you so much for being a guest today. And we'll probably do a follow up another time and looking forward to more articles from you as well. All right. Thank you so much.